Hello and welcome to the very first lecture in financial analysis and reporting. Before we start, I'd like to share with you one of my most favorite Bible verses. It is found in Matthew chapter 6 verse 33, but we will start with verse 31 to provide context. It says, So, do not worry, saying, What shall we eat? Or what shall we drink? Or what shall we wear? Verse 33 is the promise and the assurance. And it says, But seek first his, that is God's kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. So my prayer is that as we start this semester, that you will develop that trust in God and seek his kingdom and his righteousness above all, because all these things, as promised, will be added unto us as well. Let's pray. Our most gracious Heavenly Father, as we start this semester, we'd like to surrender all to you. We want you to be in the driving seat of our lives, and we want to commit everything to your care. We invite the Holy Spirit to be in us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, topic one is covered in chapter one of your textbook, and we will be looking at the institutional setting for financial reports, which is a very good way to start financial analysis and reporting our subject title. So we will be covering seven learning objectives in topic one. We'll cover in part A of this lecture, the first four learning objectives. All right, let's start with learning objective one. Here we will explain the importance of financial statements as valuable sources of information. So why are financial statements important? Without adequate information provided, investors cannot properly judge the opportunities and risks of investment alternatives. Financial statements are normally the first and the best source of financial information about a company's past performance, current health, as well as prospects for the future. Financial statements, including the accompanying disclosures, provide information about the company's economic wealth and how that wealth changes over time. So financial statements really are used for various reasons. It can be used as an analytical tool, as a management report card, it can be used as early warning signal if the company is going into some financial difficulties it should be reflected in the financial statements and thereby provide early warning signal to prospective users also it can be a basis for prediction as well as a vehicle for accountability by the management of the company. Now, it has to be stated at the outset, though, that accounting is not an exact science. Mathematics is an exact science, but accounting is not. Some financial statement items, like, for example, cash, are measured with a high degree of reliability and precision. So those numbers are what we refer to as objective data. However, there are many items in the financial statements that are not as objective or as precise as cash. For example, product warranty liabilities are one of those items that are uncertain or subjective in nature. They are derived from estimates of future events, and as such, they really are not that precise or reliable. So it's important for investors and other users not just to accept the numbers provided in the financial statements at their face value. Financial statements, therefore, must be construed, and its readers must be aware that the financial statements must be understood in 
accordance with the financial reporting standards. That's why we will be looking at the financial reporting standards in this lecture. We will also need to recognize that management can really shape the information provided by the company. And as financial statement users or readers, we need to distinguish between reliable and judgmental information. We need to distinguish between subjective as well as objective information. Right, in Learning Objective 2, we'll understand how financial reporting addresses the information demands of current as well as potential stakeholders allocating resources and monitoring manager activities. So let's start with the economics of accounting information. Why are accounting information provided? Well, financial statements really serve two key functions. The first one is information asymmetry. What do we mean by information asymmetry? If I have information that is not available to the public, that means there is an information asymmetry. All right, I have more information than what other users have, so that is information asymmetry. If everyone, all the interested users, have similar information provided to them, then there is information symmetry. All right, so information asymmetry is one of the key functions of financial statements. So why is that? Well, Financial statements provide a way for companies management to transfer the information that they have about business activities to people outside the company, thereby reducing information asymmetry. Another key function of financial statements is contract efficiency. Financial statement information is normally included in contracts between the company and other parties. Why is that? Because the other parties would like to be well informed as to the overall performance of the company. Moving on to the demand and supply for accounting information. Users demand financial statements because they are a valuable source of information about financial condition, about the overall performance of the firm, as well as resource stewardship. How do the managers manage the funds that were made available to them? Who provides or supplies the financial information? Well, obviously, it's the management of the firm. So the supply of financial information is guided by the costs of producing as well as disseminating or providing the information to the interested parties. The benefits that it will provide to the company, that means the benefits of supplying the information will kind of determine how much information will be provided out there about the company's performance. So let's talk about who are the users of the financial statements. Well, obviously the shareholders, the investors, including prospective investors would be one of the main users. They would need this financial information for them to be able to make investment decisions. Which company should they invest in? The managers as well as the employees of the organization are also interested users. Managers would like to know how well the company is performing. They also need to make decisions in terms of compensation contracts, compensation for themselves and other employees. And of course, the employees would like to know about their pension. The company-sponsored pension plans will be one of those information that the employees would be interested with. What about lenders and suppliers? Yes, they are interested users as well. The lenders, such as the banks, would like to know how risky the company is in terms of providing funds or loans to the company. And the suppliers would like to know 
more about the performance of the company because they want to know if the company can abide by the covenants placed between the company and the suppliers. Customers too will be interested with the financial condition of the entity. Why is that? Well, if they are buying something and they are getting warranties or support, they would like to know if the company will still be there to provide the necessary warranties in the future and for repeat purchases as well. Governments and regulators are also another group of users interested in the financial performance of the company. So this is why for regulatory purposes, there are mandatory reports. They also need the information about the profitability, for example, of the firm in order for them to be able to get their taxes calculated. And of course, for other regulated industries, particularly, for example, those that are in the highly sensitive industries, the government would like to know what additional laws need to be promulgated in order for the smooth running of the country and the economy. Let's move on to learning objective three. Here we'll describe how the supply of financial information is influenced by the cost of producing and disseminating the financial information as well as the benefits that is provided. So let's talk about the disclosure incentives and how it affects the supply of financial information. Mandatory reports, for example, those that are mandated by the Securities and Exchange Commission, the SEC, and the Financial Accounting Standards Board, FASB, are designed to ensure minimum level of reporting. However, there are many companies that provide voluntary disclosures that go beyond minimum requirements. Now, you might say, why provide more information when you are not required? Well, because voluntary disclosures are guided by the cost and the benefit. You can obtain more capital at a cheaper cost or lower cost if you are providing more information that are well and above the minimum requirements. Also, you could get better terms with the suppliers of the company if you are taken as a low risk company and it avoids the lemon problem. So when we talk about lemons, you know how car salesmen will probably sell you not so good car at a higher price if they can outsell it to you. And so you are kind of buying, this is why the term was called, you're kind of buying lemon instead of car. If you have been cheated by a very good car salesman. So in terms of companies, you can avoid the lemon problem by actually providing voluntary disclosures. Because if you have a lot of good things to say about your company, then why withhold it from the general public? So in a sense, when you're providing voluntary disclosures well and above what is required, people will, or the general public will have this impression that you are telling the truth about your company being a good performer. So those are the benefits of disclosing more than what is required. But what are the costs? Well, disclosure costs include, of course, the cost of collecting, processing, and disseminating those financial information. Also, competitive disadvantage costs. If you are voluntary disclosing everything about your company, your strategy, and all that, your competitors can easily copy it or can better your performance. Litigation costs as well as political costs are additional costs to providing voluntary disclosures. So if you say something that is not true, you could be sued in the future. So companies that confront different financial reporting costs and benefits are likely to choose different accounting 
and reporting practices. So really the disclosure incentives will give way to the supply of the financial information. If the disclosure benefits are higher, then the companies will disclose. If the costs are higher, then the company will disclose just what is mandatory, the minimum level of reporting. Now, because more and more companies are frequently providing voluntary disclosures going beyond the minimum requirements, the SEC has promulgated this regulatory fair disclosure. We call it Reg FD. So what's the purpose of Reg FD? To prevent selective disclosure by companies to market professionals and certain shareholders. The big shareholders, for example, used to get more information about the companies whilst the general public and those that are individual investors may not necessarily get the same information provided to market analysts and big shareholders. So Reg FD is designed to level the playing field between individual investors as well as the big investing companies, the institutional investors. And they do it by limiting what management can say in private conversations and meetings between the market professionals and the institutional investors. So it's important that financial information must be disclosed to all interested parties at the same time, not just the big players in the market. Let's move on to learning objective four. Here we'll discuss how accounting rules are established and will explain how managers can shape the financial information communicated to outsiders and still be within those rules. We know that financial reporting is governed by principles and rules that are known as the generally accepted accounting principles or GAAP. All right. Now GAAP actually evolve over time as the business conditions change. The former chairman of FASB, Beresford, said this, there's virtually no standard that the FASB has ever written that is free from judgment in its application. So we can generally say that all accounting standards are requiring some kind of judgment. In making that judgment, the overarching principle is this, what we refer to as decision usefulness. From decision usefulness, we have the primary characteristics, relevance and faithful representation. And then each of these two primary characteristics has components. And there are also certain enhancing characteristics. This is what we call the qualitative characteristics. So let's discuss each of these. Let's start with the primary characteristics of relevance and faithful representation. And information is relevant when it helps users form more accurate predictions about the future or it allows them to better understand how past economic events have affected the business. Relevance has three components, predictive value, confirmatory value, and materiality. So what do we mean by predictive value? When the information improves the decision maker's ability to forecast the future outcome of past or present events, then it means it has predictive value. All right, should I invest in this company? Well, it looks like in future, its share price will double. All right. And how do I base my prediction? 
that the share price will double? Well, I have a look at the past information provided, the current condition of the firm, and it looks like in the past it has quickly doubled its share price. And so the probability of it doubling, for example, is highly likely. So predictive value has to do with the decision maker being able to forecast the future outcome of the company. The next component is confirmatory value. The information has confirmatory value if it either reaffirms or alters the decision maker's earlier beliefs. My prediction is that the share price will double. I'll have a look at the information and I can see that the growth of the company based on the financial information provided confirms my prediction. All right. And the third component is materiality. So an information is material if its omission or misstatement could influence the decisions that the financial statement users make about a specific reporting entity. In my example, the share price doubling and all that. All right. Let's say there is an information saying that the, this company have invested something like 25% of their overall company's value to a company in Asia that is not doing very well. Would that information be considered material? Well, I believe so because it's 25% of the overall company's net worth being invested somewhere that is not doing well. So my prediction that the share price will increase or double in the near future will be affected by this information. And therefore, omission of this information or misstatement could actually influence my decision to either invest or not invest. Let's move on to the second primary characteristic and that is faithful representation. When the financial information actually depicts the underlying economic event pertaining to the firm, then that means the information has faithful representation. It has three components again, completeness, neutrality, and being free from material error. So completeness just means that everything that is important is present in the information provided. So financial information can be false or misleading if important facts are omitted, thereby making the information incomplete. All right. What about neutrality? An information cannot be selected to favor one set of interested parties over another. All right. So when I am providing information only to the selected analysts or the big institutional investors, and I'm not providing it to the general public, that means neutrality is not being adhered to. So what about being free from material error? Well, some minimum level of accuracy is necessary for an estimate to be a faithful representation of an economic event. Meaning to say, there could be some errors made, for example, and if its amount is very little, then we can still say that the company's financial information is free from material error because it's only a small amount. If a company has net worth of $5 million and there is a few hundred dollars that is omitted, from the financial information, then that means this amount is immaterial and therefore we could still say that the information faithfully represents the overall performance of the company. So when we're talking about materiality, materiality really depends both on quantitative as well as qualitative considerations. When we say quantitative, it means the amount of misstatement. A few hundred dollars compared to net worth of a few million dollars is quantitatively immaterial. All right. Qualitative has to do with the possible impact of the misstatement. We could say that an employee 
for example, has been mistreated. One employee compared to, let's say, 20,000 employees will be considered immaterial, right? But if that employee can actually create a lot of negative publicity for the company, the omission of that information can still have a big qualitative impact on the company. So that could still be considered material in nature. All right. So let's move on to comparability, verifiability, timeliness, and understandability. So what is comparability? It simply allows the analyst or any user of the information to identify similarities and differences between the underlying economic events because those similarities or differences are not obscured or hidden by some accounting disclosure or method. All right, so that's comparability. Being able to compare company A versus company B. Verifiability, on the other hand, means that independent measurers should get similar results when using the same yardstick. So for example, if you are an accountant and you're looking at company A's profitability, another accountant who has the same knowledge, information, and following the same accounting standards should be able to reach the same profitability for the same company, company A. So that means the information is verifiable because two experts are able to reach the same conclusion after looking at the information provided. Timeliness, well, this simply refers to information that is available to the decision maker while it's still fresh, while it's still needed in order for it to influence the decision. It's like there's no use to bring the grass to a dead horse. No matter how much food you put in front of a dead horse, it's already dead. Why? Because the food did not arrive in time for the horse to be able to be sustained. All right. So once the decision has already been made, only then is the information provided, and that means information is not timely. The last qualitative characteristic, understandability, simply means that the characteristic of the information enables the users to be able to comprehend or understand its meaning. Now, this characteristic of understandability, however, requires that a certain level of knowledge is expected of the users, all right? It's just like for this particular subject, you did have prerequisite subjects, right? So that prerequisite subject enables you to be able to understand the concepts and topics that we're going to discuss in this particular subject, financial analysis and reporting. All right, let's move on to how our accounting standards develop. In the United States, the Securities and Exchange Commission has the ultimate authority to determine the rules to be followed by publicly listed companies. The SEC has enforcement authority. They can mandate making rules to be mandatory. However, it is the FASB that currently sets the accounting standards. So whilst SEC is the enforcement authority, FASB is the standard setting body. Now, auditing standards for public companies are set by another body, and that is the Public Company Accounting Oversight Board, PCAOB. In other countries, standards are set by organizations like the FASB or by law. Many countries look to the U.S. GAAP for guidance in their preparation of the financial reports. All right. Lately, it's actually the International Accounting Standards Board, IASB, that develops worldwide accounting standards. So how are accounting standards developed? Standard setting is really a technical and political process. In developing and updating accounting standards, 
the FASB in the United States follows a due process procedure to develop accounting standards updates that are designed to ensure public input in the decision process. So the updates for accounting standards go through three steps. The first one is discussion memorandum stage. The second is the exposure draft stage. When an exposure draft is issued, interested parties can make their submissions as to how the exposure draft should be revised if there is a need to. And then the third and final step is the voting stage. So as FASB develops new rules or updates the rules, there are different bodies that exerts pressure. So who are these different parties? The professional associations, particularly the accounting professional associations would be one. Industry trade groups will also be another body. And so with regulatory agencies, individual companies particularly the multinational companies and of course prominent individuals anyone who has a vested interest and the economic ability to put pressure on FASB. Now just a short glimpse of the history of US GAAP. In 1929 that was the year when there was a huge stock market crash and that's also when the Great Depression happened and this provoked widespread concern about the financial disclosure environment in the US. The Securities Act of 1933 was issued and this established the Securities and Exchange Commission being an independent agency of the government to regulate securities sold to the public and any exchanges where those securities were traded. The next year, Securities Exchange Act of 1934 was issued and this requires the financial statements of all publicly traded firms to be audited by independent accountants. The SEC relied primarily on the AICPA, the American Institute of Certified Public Accountants, which is the National Professional Organization of Certified Public Accountants, to develop and enforce accounting standards. And in 1973, the AICPA created the Financial Accounting Standards Board, which is the new independent full-time standard setting organization established in the private sector replacing the Accounting Principles Board, APB. Now, let's have a look at the GAAP applicable for public and private companies. Before 2013, publicly traded as well as private companies followed the same GAAP. In 2013, the FASB and the private company council issued private company decision-making framework. This framework identified circumstances where it would be appropriate to provide separate guidance for private companies. Whilst FASB has neither the authority nor the responsibility to enforce compliance with GAAP, the responsibility rests with the company management the accounting profession as well as the SEC and of course the courts. How does FASB keeps track of accounting standards? In 2009, FASB created a single database of all existing GAAP literature and they call this the Accounting Standards Codification, ASC. ASC is like a filing cabinet that is online all right it's not a physical filing cabinet but an online filing cabinet that groups all authoritative rules into roughly 90 topics asc is now the authoritative source of u.s accounting and reporting standards for non-governmental entities as well accounting standards updates or asus modify the codification 
and it provides background information about the revised guidance and provide the basis for conclusions on changes made to ASC. Let's look at the ASC topical structure and referencing. The ASC uses a structure in which the authoritative accounting guidance is organized into topics, subtopics, sections, subsections, and paragraphs. So topics are grouped into four main areas, the presentation, financial statement accounts, the broad transactions, and industries. The subtopics represent the subdivisions of topics and are distinguished by type or scope. Then you move on to sections. Sections are subdivisions such as the recognition, the measurement, or disclosure that denotes the nature of the content in a subtopic. Subsections and paragraphs allow further segregation or divisions and it allows navigation of content. It's pretty much like the Bible. The Bible has different books and then it has chapters and it has verses. All right, I'd like to talk to you briefly about this act, Sarbanes-Oxley Act known as SOX. In 2002, the Sarbanes-Oxley Act created the Public Company Accounting Oversight Board, PCAOB, and its main function is to establish auditing standards, including standards for independence and ethics. It also conducts periodic quality reviews and inspections of auditors' work. The PCAOB can also investigate any alleged audit failures and impose penalties on auditors as well as the firms. PCAOB can also fine or censure, suspend or bar from practice auditors and audit firms for any wrongdoing. There are two main SOX compliance that are applicable for our purposes. Section 302, which pertains to corporate responsibility for financial reports, requires that the CEOs, the chief executive officer, and the CFOs, chief financial officers, to personally certify the accuracy of financial statements and related disclosures in the annual and quarterly reports. The other section that is relevant is Section 404. It pertains to management assessment of internal controls and it requires CEOs and CFOs to periodically assess and certify the effectiveness of internal controls and procedures. It also requires companies external auditor to examine and report on management's assessment of internal controls as well as the effectiveness of the controls themselves. Before we end learning objective four, I'd like to point you to these incentive conflicts and financial reporting because this is really where management shape the information provided to the users. Why is that? If there are rules and accounting standards that need to be adhered to, then how is it that management can shape the information provided to users? Well, it's because the generally accepted accounting principles gap permits alternatives and therefore it requires estimates and it incorporates management judgments. So managers have reasons to exploit the flexibility of GAAP. And how do they do it? Well, they do so by smoothing the reported earnings numbers. So for example, they can have fluctuating earnings, revenues from year one, year two, and year three. And if they have ability to ship some of the earnings to, for example, year one, when there wasn't much earnings, and they can see that year two will have more earnings, they might just smoothen it a little bit. They also do it by manipulating revenues or expenses to achieve bonus goals. So it is possible and highly likely that some companies would say that their bonus will be based on the increase of revenues from one year to another. So if they can see 
that the revenues in year two will be so much higher and then in year three it might drop but it might say all right well we will manipulate the revenues and expenses so that some of the profit that is supposed to be in year two will go to year three so that it can continue on an increasing trajectory to be able to get the bonuses that they will get all right and another way managers can exploit the flexibility of gap is by downplaying the significance of contingent liabilities by nature contingent liabilities are actually estimates all right because they are not like cash that are highly reliable and so they could downplay for example the estimate for these contingent liabilities and therefore paint a better picture of the financial condition of the company now the sec fast b auditors sound governance practices and of course the courts serve to counterbalance this possible opportunistic financial reporting practices all right we will pause for a while before we move on to the next three learning objectives in topic one bye for now